Please stand. And today we're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 18. The Bible reads, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Thus the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, Pastor Chan will come and preach. You may be seated. Paul wrote this second letter to the Corinthians who are undergoing great hardship and tribulation. And his chief purpose in this letter, in his epistle, was to give them comfort. I'm going to come back to that theme, that important theme of God giving comfort to the people of God. But before I do that, I want to refer to Paul's opening words in his letter, which is so revealing to his perspective and relationship with God, which should be our perspective as well. He first introduces himself as an apostle. The word apostle means a person that's sent. Very simple. Apostle means a person that was sent. And contextually, it refers to the 11 disciples who met Christ, and then arguably, the apostle Paul, who's the 12th. They were sent by Christ, met Christ, sent by Christ to continue his work. He ascended to heaven. He sits at the right hand of the throne of glory next to his father. And before he left, he sent out these 12 disciples to continue his work. And he speaks as one of authority. He knows that he was sent by Christ. And just like an ambassador represents the country or nation with whom he was sent out for and carries the authority of that country. And so Paul, knowing that he was commissioned and sent out by Christ, stands in authority as he speaks the word of God. So he knows, he knows, and he makes the people know that this transaction through his letter does not come from him, but from God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be our attitude as well. Think about if you were in, back in the days of Paul and received his letter, 
you were in Corinth, and how seriously you would take his letter, knowing he was an apostle sent out by the Lord Jesus. And let us ask ourselves, do we have that same reverential attitude about God's word and the authority that God gave Paul through Christ in his word? So every time we read the word of God, we must reorient ourselves and remind ourselves that God is speaking to us. And his words are timeless, they're alive, and they speak to our case, our condition, our generation, though written over 2,000 years ago, is so relevant to us today. So I want to give you that aspect of orientation. We need to very reverentially hear the word of God and see that the demands that God has through Christ upon us are no less than to the Christians in Corinth in that day. And then true Christians are also in the Greek language called the sent out ones. I've said that before, but I want to reiterate or underscore that fact. An apostle was a sent out one in the singular. But Christians as, as a group and individually, of course, are the sent out ones. Now think about this. I want you to get this, it's so important. The local church that Jesus Christ founded are referred to as the called out ones, ecclesia, the called out ones. We have been called out from the world by Christ himself to have an encounter with him in conversion and to be brought into a local church. So you, brothers and sisters, are the called out, called out ones from the world. Christ called you. He spoke to you. He called you. You listened. And God taught you in the soul. And you came to Christ. And you were brought to this local church. You are the called out ones. And when you gather together, as we gather together at the called out ones, we do as the first disciples did. We have meals together, we break bread, we have prayers, we have fellowship. We hear the word of God preached and taught, and then we're sent out. We're the sent out ones to find the called out ones whom God, whom Christ is calling through us, through our testimony. So do you see that spiritual circulation, if you will, that spiritual cycle? Because upon this is how the entirety of Christianity was built and will be perpetuated until Christ comes back. This is done in the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of Christ, to use sinful men ourselves, sinful, saved beings, fallen creatures, to be used in God's great plan to save those whom he has called. And what a privilege to be used by God in that way, but we always have to reorient ourselves. We are special because God called you through Christ, and you have the authority in a different capacity, of course, but you stand in authority in speaking for Christ and giving your testimony and sharing the gospel of Christ because you're part of that spiritual circulation to advance the kingdom of God. And every member is important. We function as a whole. You have been called out from the world. Leaving the world. Come into Christ and the local church. Where we gather and love each other. Minister to each other in love. And grace. Mercy and kindness. To stir each other up. To provoke each other to love and to good works. To study the word of God, to hear the God, word of God preached, to, to be consoled. And then we are sent out to find more called out ones. That is part of God's plan of spiritual, the spiritual cycle and circulation upon which his kingdom, Christ's kingdom shall come. And that's so important to see you are not just a spoke in a wheel. No, you are living, being empowered by almighty God. 
in the image of Christ as Christ's representative. So let us live up to our authority and standing. Get power from God. Be more conformed in the image of Christ so we would more powerfully do our duties. And that's all of our challenges and as a church. Now let's look at the opening words of Paul's letter because I don't want you to miss again the apostles Paul relationship with God and how we should think about God and what he has done for us. I talked about his his authority as an apostle. Now let's look at the next verse, two verses. 2 Corinthians 1, 2, 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Now think about these precious characteristics of God. Grace, mercy, truth. Grace, undeserved kindness from God. We don't deserve any kindness from God. We're his enemies. While, we're, while we were his enemies, God showed his love toward us in that he sent Christ to die. Grace, undeserved kindness. And then mercy. Mercy is where we do not get what we deserve. We are sinners and rebelling against God. We have broken his laws. We deserve judgment. But in God's mercy, he withholds, he withholds his judgment in Christ. In Christ, so important. His mercy of withholding judgment is only found in the person of Christ. And so you must be in Christ if you are to experience the saving mercy of God. Yes, we all have common mercy. God sends the rain and the sun upon the just and the unjust. But if you want the special mercy of God in salvation for your eternal soul, you must be found in Christ. Grace, mercy, and then peace. If you have trusted Christ by his grace and through his mercy in Christ, then you experience peace. And I'm not just talking about inner tranquility. And satisfaction is more than that. It's being brought together with God, with whom we're all enemies previously, brought together in a loving relationship, accepted in the beloved, adopted as a child of God, having a relationship with God, peace forevermore, adjoining together with God for eternity. That's the experience that the Apostle Paul reminds the Christians at Corinth, and we need that reminder too, about God's grace, mercy, and the peace. Now let's go back to those words because there's so much more in there. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God. The central focus, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, if we have rightly meditated upon God's grace, upon God's mercy and God's peace in our hearts, if we've rightly meditated, then we would have a spontaneous outburst of blessing our God. Blessing God in the original language means praise be to God. And if we had the heart of David, then we too would say with David, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let us be people of deep meditation, reflection. Let us not take of all persons our God for granted. That is our habit, is it not? We are creatures of habit and creatures of neglect and creatures of thanklessness. And that's why we need to get our minds and our hearts in the word of God and put ourselves in place of the recipients of the letters with which the authors wrote and that we could be spoken to afresh. This is a living book. If you're converted, you have a living soul. We need to be kept alive by the power of God through his word. That's why this is not a duty. This is, this is our, a necessity. 
We, we, we live through the word of God. And if without the word of God, we die experientially. We don't die, of course, we don't lose our eternal souls in salvation, but we lose that experiential closeness and knowledge of God through Christ. We become attached to the things of this world. And I'm going to talk about that some more. So we need every help. You see, God knows what he's doing. After the counsel of his own will, he gave us his word to keep us close to him, to keep us challenged, to keep us relevant with him because his word is relevant to us. We need to cherish the word of God, love it, meditate upon it, and obey it, of course. And then remember, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, as I've said in the beginning, primarily to comfort them. So let me read that verse in its entirety. Grace be to you and peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You see, as Christians sent out from the local church in obedience to Christ, yes, we go out with the message of the gospel, but we also go out with a message of comfort. He's the God of all comfort, and He has comforted us. So we have a ministry that is so full-orbed, so multifaceted. We give the gospel of Christ. We do the ministry of reconciliation. We do the ministry, as Brother Griffith likes to say, of doing good and of healing and of comfort. And so Paul says in the following verse, who comforteth, who, who is who? The God of all comfort. The God of all comfort comforted us. 2 Corinthians 1 4. The God of all comfort, the pronoun who comforteth us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Paul wanted to make clear that God comforts us and we are to comfort others. That comes out of the page. And yes, that's our job. Yes, it is primarily to spread the gospel of Christ. But we should do all that we can to provide comfort that God gives us to other people. We know our God. You're a brother and sister in Christ. You know God. You know the comfort that God has given you. And so let us share our God, our God of comfort to others. It's incumbent upon us. It's our responsibility. It should be our heart's desire and need to share of all the graces that God has given us. So as we go about within the church, ministering to one another, one another let us comfort one another. And when we are sent out into the world, let us comfort them as well. Let us establish bonds with people. We don't immediately Tell people about Christ unless God provides that opportunity. We try to provide, we try to establish a relationship, a platform of communication, of trust. And then as they tell us of their burdens, their cares, their tribulations, then God has given you an opportunity to comfort that person. That's how the gospel is spread. That's not how I was taught, but I'm learning. This is Bible. It's been there all along, but I'm learning. You see, we get to know people. We get to establish close relationships with people. We love them. And as they feel comfortable with us and safe with us and trust us, they share us their burdens, their cares, and then we comfort them because we have a God of all comfort. And we know that the God who comforts us can comfort them and wants to comfort them. Yes, chiefly through Christ. But there are steps in that process of awakening and being drawn to Christ. Think about your own self. Most of us do not come to Christ instantly, but it was a process of somebody loving you and being kind to you 
and, and you're thinking about, this is the kind of life I want to have. And God spoke to your heart and you, you gave them things that were bothering you, burdened, that you were burdened with. And they comforted you, perhaps. And then God worked in you to will and to do his good pleasure and drew you to Christ. And that's what our job should be. So this whole book is on God comforting the Christians in Corinth. In chapter one, Paul writes about God's comfort in their everyday life. In chapter two of God's comfort in restoring the sinning Christian. In chapter three, God's comfort in the glorious ministry of Christ. And in the chapter that we're dealing with in the passage that Brother Jesse read, God's comfort in the ministry of suffering for Christ. And that motivates Paul, thinking about how God comforts him in his suffering for Christ. It stirs up his heart to give all glory to God. And so that leads, to, leads me to my text this morning. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yes, Paul is speaking of a paradox, but this paradox compares the physical with the spiritual. So it's really not a paradox at all, and we'll, I'll explain as we go through. Point one, first, the outward man refers to this temporary life and world. Our outward man, the things which are seen are temporal or temporary. The outward man speaks of the, our physical bodies and this physical world. This is the world or five senses of sight, of sound, of smell, of taste, and of touch. The five senses. This physical world can be measured by whatever measurement that man has discovered or invented. And so the secular person only admits reality to that which is perceived by his five senses or can be measured by a scientist. That's his world. That's all there is. All that you can see or can be measured. Everything else is fantasy to the secular humanist. But of course, this physical world and this physical body is dying. Even secular man has arrived to that conclusion of late, relatively of late. Many years ago, when I was a young person, they started to talk about whether the food supply will be sufficient to feed the whole world. Then men began to thought that this planet and life here on this planet will not be forever. And then there's many things that man has thought of that things that could be the cause of our extinction. I talked about feeding the world. And then there's, when I was in high school, it was the thinning of the ozone layer. And that's been somewhat disproved. And then global warming is more contemporary or an asteroid hitting our planet. But I want you to think about this. The reality for human seculars or someone who's not saved, might be religious, but not really saved, their perspective on life is, this is it. It's my life. Chiefly, and the world around me, it's all going to pass someday. And that's all you have. And so what does man do? He pours everything into this limited life. He doesn't think it's limited. He doesn't want to think about its limit. He's too busy trying to keep himself alive. Kind, trying to be in good shape. Yet, of course, he knows that he is dying. He constantly is reminded of that by his gray hairs, by the wrinkles in his face, by his inability to do certain things physically that he used to do, perhaps by gaining weight and not being able to lose it as easily as it was in the past. We have reminders that we're getting old. 
And so man, thinking that this is all there is, pours all his cares and interests in preserving this life and maintaining a youthful appearance. Now, I'm not saying that's bad, but it's neglecting the truth that life will end and your life will end. You may know that you're aging, but you don't want to think about the day of your death. You don't even want to think about your aging process. And certainly, most people assume that they'll live to that good old ripe age that they don't want to think about. You're stuck. This outward man, if that's all there is, and this physical world, if that's all there is, is a rather gloomy and nihilistic and pessimistic perspective to life. And those philosophers, especially in yesterday's, yesteryears, that have meditated upon the fatalistic, nihilistic, pessimistic ideas of this physical life and its end, led, led, led depressing lives and had a high rate of suicide. So you would tell to me, oh yes, I know I'm gonna die. I know I'm getting older. But the impact of that truth, the ramifications of that truth, how has that been applied to your life, applied to your, your way of living, how you plan your life? Do you think about your death? Some do, some have. Not, not very many, but some have. Some are very responsible and have planned for their revocable living trust. They have planned for and have purchased their plot at, at Forest Lawn, for example, have figured out how they're gonna divide their, their wealth to their children. That's all the external, but what about life after death? Remember the alternative is this very depressing thought of it, it's the end of it all, that you're just like an ant, you're just an animal that lives and that's the end of it all. And the ramification of that, the purpose of her life is for nothing. You just live to have some experience. You can't even bottle up the experience to experience it again. It's over, it's over. That is the perspective of the outward man. And so even if you accept the fact that you have a temporal life and you're gonna die, what have you dealt with? What happens after death? Do you ever think about that? And second, not only is the outward man and this world temporary, temporal, temporary, not forever, but they are perishing presently. They are perishing before our eyes. But more of an immediate concern is your life and your death. Look up, please. I know it's not a pleasant thought to think about your death, but it's an important subject. So I would ask you to think about this. So even those who say they're religious, very rarely, but not saved, the religious but lost, they might say that they believe in an afterlife, but how often does that afterlife really intersect this present life? You see, are they thinking that far ahead? Do they think about God? I don't know, I wonder. And what about those that glibly say, yeah, I'm just gonna, degenerate and decompose and go back to the ground. People say that very glibly, like a matter of factly, not troubled by it at all. But it's easy to say without having that thought impact your life. You see, they're the most dissociated at all of what they're saying. Because if they thought about that they're just a decomposition, that they're just soil and fertilizer in forest lawn, then they would Think, how depressing is that? But you see the Bible. The Bible gives hope because it comes from a God of hope. The God of all hope who gives hope to all those answers that I pose to you. The difficult answers of life, God gives answers to of great hope. All of the answers to our outward man 
The things that we, are, that we see are temporal. You know the answer. Many of you know the answer. Of course, the answer is in Christ. To receive eternity through Jesus Christ. You know that in your mind. But you know nothing of it, many of you, in your life. And you're just as dissociated from the truth as that human secularist that says, I'm just going to decompose and be fertilizer. You say, I know I need Christ, but how does Christ impact your life? I dare say very little. But before I bring the gospel of hope and salvation to you that are lost, I would like to speak to the Christians for a moment. Because Paul's words of his outer man perishing had particular relevance to him. You see, Paul was not merely talking about, I'm aging like everyone else. No, no, no. This was a man that was driven to die for Christ. And he did. All of the physical and mental and psychological assaults that Paul listed in the Bible, and I'm not going to go through them. And many of you know them. But many of the things that he did, the stressors in his body and on his, and on his soul hastened and accelerated the perishing of his body. The stress, the cortisol, the aging process was sped up, accelerated in life of Paul. And that's why he said his outward man is perishing. And so were the Corinthians under stress and under trials. And so Paul is trying to comfort them. But Paul knew what he was talking about when he said his outward man is perishing because he didn't put his outward man as a priority. No, he didn't put his own life as first, but the kingdom of God and Christ. And so he truly presented his body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. And he knew very well that was more than his reasonable service. He offered it up again and again. After being stoned, he gave it up again and again. After being a shipwreck, he gave it again and again. After being torn up by wild beasts, he gave it again and again. He knew his outward man was perishing. And like Reverend Richard Wormbrandt and so many others that have been imprisoned and tortured for Christ, Paul said, Galatians 6, 17, Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us saw the film on Brother Richard Wormbrandt as he testified before the U.S. Senate. And he showed his deep gouges in his body from being tortured for Christ. Well, Paul can certainly say the same thing as he did. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus So let us put the spiritual priority where it ought to be. I'm not saying that God has called us to torture, to be tortured to that degree for Christ. I'm not saying that. I don't know. But we have been called to suffer some. In the words of the Apostle Paul, In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he has the proper perspective. For our light affliction in our ministry for Christ in this temporal world, it's light, light affliction, which is but for a moment in this temporary life. But it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, he he saw spiritual things clearly. Our afflictions are light compared to Christ. Yes, they're light. But for a moment, temporary, he had the proper perspective. This temporary world, my outward man is perishing. He knew that. So his affliction is not forever. It's light compared to my Lord Jesus Christ. Just for a moment, just temporary. Compared to the eternal weight of glory of what God will give him for suffering for Christ. That's a no-brainer, a spiritual brainer. I'd rather have the eternal glory than this temporary light affliction. And so you, so we too must see life through the spiritual eyes of the truth. 
that this temporal world is temporary and the eternal world is eternal and glorious. And then we should act our life accordingly. And so by the grace of God, let us have the attitude of Paul for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To sum it up, for me, for us to live as Christ, to die is gain. Third and last. Third, as the outer man perishes, the inner man of the true Christian, and only the true Christian has an inner man, can be renewed daily. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man, as I've said, speaks of the physical body. But what is this inward man? He referred to it earlier in the same chapter of his letter. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. When Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The earthen vessels is his outward man that perishes. When I went to the Holy Land and you look on the ground, there is pottery, clay and pottery everywhere to be found because it's fragile. Thousands of years old on the ground, earth and vessel. We have this treasure in earth and vessels, our outer man, frail, temporary. And this earthen vessel holds a precious commodity. The inner man of the saved Christian, the eternal soul. Intuitively, as a young child, God showed me that. And so as I stood in front of the mirror and I touched my body, my face, my body, intuitively I knew this is not all there is. This is not the important stuff. Something inside is much more important. And that's my inner man. I wasn't even saved yet, but God by his grace revealed that to me. And I, that thought has stayed with me for the rest of my life. It helped me by the grace of God to trust Christ and helped me day by day. To see that this outer shell, this outer man, this earthen vessel is frail. And I need to take care of what's inside. My inner man, I have to make sure it's fed. I have to make sure that it's around God's people to be encouraged. I have to keep on looking at Christ that I might become more made in the image of him and to do his work. Now, I'm a medical doctor. I do not neglect the body. Well, actually, I do neglect my own body. But I don't neglect others' bodies. When I tell them to exercise and to lose weight and to control their diabetes or their blood pressure, to eat right, to be at the right weight, to do all these different things, yes, we have to be good stewards of our bodies. But we should not make our body the most important thing. Again, I'm not saying neglect your body. But your heart should be with Christ and his kingdom, knowing all along that the outer man is perishing and there's nothing you can do concretely to forestall that, to stop that. Yes, you can, you can temporize, you can hold off the disability and death for a while if we're good stewards of our body. That's not what I'm talking about. But the ultimate process of degeneration and of perishing, and the second law of thermodynamics is a given. We are going to decline. We are going to die. And so why put my interest on that which is perishing? But take care of the treasure inside, you see. And that's why we need to think about Christ and think about his kingdom, be fed by the word of God, because there is a tendency we are creatures of our senses. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. And we're drawn back to that. If we're not being spiritual, we're drawn back to this physical world and the lust thereof. And we can become lukewarm or backslidden. We don't realize the priority is our is, is spirituality, eternity, our eternal soul and the, and the advancement of Christ's kingdom. That's why it's so important to come and to be involved in the ministry of the local church because we need to be built up. 
We need to be provoked unto love and to good works. A real Christian cannot live the Christian life. There, can, there is no successful Christian that's a lone ranger. No, we need the local church. We're part of a body. And we're members. We need to help each other. When one falls, the other lifts him up. And that's how we sustain a good walk with Christ. By being concerned with one another. By considering one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's our jobs. And our inner man must be developed. Let us have the heart of Paul and love for the word of God, as I've been saying. He said in Romans 7.22, For I delight in the law of God, the Bible, after the inward man. You see, he delighted in, in feeding upon the word of God. That's why he grew so strong in his inner man, because he fed, he delighted in the word of God. And as I've said last week, to him it was more tasteful than honey in the honeycomb. He loved the word of God. Thy word, O, o, o Lord, is, is my love. And let us too love the word of God that we can be built up. Paul lived his life consistent with his faith as revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, we can't do all this by ourselves. Yes, we need to read the Bible. Yes, we need to reorient ourselves to that which is perishing, the outward man. We need to take care of our inner man. We can do all those things that we ought. But in the end, it's God through his spirit that strengthens us. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. You see, if we abide in Christ and we abide in his words, Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith. And they, then we are rooted and established in love. And our inner man is matured, is strengthened. So that when we do ministry, we be more effective. That we can bring more glory to God. That we'd see more clearly the things of God and be less attached to the things of this world. Brothers and sisters, let us not be a, too attached and comfortable in this world. Let us not be so fond of things that delight our flesh. Let us not be too acquainted with them. Third and last, continuing. Third, as the outer man perishes, the inner man of the true Christian can be renewed daily as we do not look at this perishing world. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day while we look not at the things which are seen, which are temporal. As I've said, let us not give in to creature comforts too well. It can be awfully, we can become awfully attached to things of this world and we, we can convince ourselves that we need them. No, we don't need them. Marketing has told us we need them. And our creature comforts, our outer self says we want them. But then let us live primitive Christianity. I'm not saying that we should not take care of ourselves. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to polish your nails for the women. Or to get a, a, a foot treatment or something like that. I'm not saying that. But that should not be where your heart is, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Is your treasure in the kingdom of God? Is your inner man with Christ and the kingdom? Or is it with creature comforts? Is it with advancing your career? Is it even finding the beautiful women? Don't, go, don't get me wrong. That's a natural inclination that God put in there to find a helpmeet. But maybe you want more than just a help me. Maybe you want somebody with a little bit of a zip. Somebody to address your creature comfort. And then you're attached to the world. Or with an occupation, with a job, with money, with career or the rest. If you are attached to the things of this world, then you cannot attend to the things of God. In the same way that Martha was anxious and attended to the things of the busy world. And could not be with Christ to sit as a seat and to hear his word. So you, 
And so mean. If we're attached to the things of this world, we cannot put first and seek first the kingdom of God. We can't be two places at once. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And your heart can't be in two places. It's either in the world or with Christ and his church. So let us take and keep our priorities straight. Paul said to the Philippians, Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. There you go. You can't take Christ as some would have said, as some who would want to do. I'll take, I'll take Christ again, like you read a smorgasbord or buffet light. You know, I think I kind of like that. I kind of like forgiveness of sins, not thinking about hell. I'll take Christ. Well, you can't take Christ in that way. Because if you really take Christ, you will suffer with him. Because you have union with Christ and you cannot dissect Christ. And so a person who comes to Christ, the only way to come to Christ is with your eyes open. You know, and Jesus make it plain. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Made it plain and clear before he said anything else. Those are the requirements to be a true Christian. And so if you are given Christ, you're also given suffering. And of course, not looking at the perishing world, not only includes being willing to suffer, but not being enticed by the many trials and temptations that we in ourselves are insufficient to deny or to indulge in, we must humbly admit to God that we are weak and insufficient. And we ask God to have strength in our inner man through his spirit, that we would not keep our eyes on the perishing world. Third, continuing. Third, as the outer man perishes, the inner man of the true Christian can be renewed daily as we do not look at this perishing world, but we look at the things which are not seen. The invisible and eternal spiritual world, how do we see? We see with the eye of faith. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. While or as we look not at, things, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Doesn't that make sense? If something is perishing, if something lasts forever, doesn't it make sense to focus on that which is more valuable? We do that in other aspects of life. Would you rather have a coach bag than a bag from Target or one, excuse me, uh, or a fake one made from another country. You want value. And that makes sense. Doesn't it? And so too in the spiritual world. Why do we keep our eyes on that which is perishing? Before our eyes. Let us get off. Get our eyes off of that which is relatively unimportant. And put it on the valuable, the eternal the godly, the Christly, what will please God and advance his kingdom. We must become like Moses, who saw him who is invisible. And so that's why, because he saw God with his eyes of faith, who is invisible to the Egyptians. And that's why he chose to be at the receiving end of Pharaoh's wrath. And to suffer with the people of God because he saw him, God, and he feared him and he loved him over the physical circumstances of Pharaoh and the threat that Pharaoh posed. And so too we, we have imminent threats all the time, challenges, maybe threats too hard of a word, physical things in our life. 
that we are taking the task for. We have to make a spiritual choice. Where do we put our heart? What do we choose? Will it be on the kingdom of God? Or will it be on the things of this world? As Jesus says, the food, the clothing, those things the Gentiles seek, those things lost people to look after. So how unbefitting is, is it for us as Christians, brothers and sisters, if we are true Christians, how unbefitting that we act like lost people do. Jesus made it plain that we care about our clothing and our food. But ravens of the field don't worry about that, and the flowers don't, but why should we? It shows our lack of faith and trust, and it shows that we're more concerned. We have our eyes on the outer world and this perishing world, and are not focusing in on the primacy of our inner man. We need to have a proper spiritual perspective. And that's what the saints did in, the, in Hebrews 11. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 14, for here, for here in this temporal world, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Is that true of you? Are you so immersed in this world, brother and sister, that you don't see that this world is not going to continue? But your home is in heaven with God and Christ. Is that where your heart's at? And what about your life? If that's where our home is at, what about our everyday life? Paul wrote to the Philippians in 320, chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation or our lives of the inner man is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our home is in heaven, and so our walk should be in heaven. We have to be consistent. We have to let the truth be expressed in our lives and not lead a double life. Yes, double life. If we do not seek first the kingdom of God, then bluntly speaking, we are living double lives. I speak to you as I speak to myself. Let us be true to our God and to our Christ and to advance the kingdom of God. Third and last, really. Third, as the outer man perishes, the inner man of the true Christian can be renewed daily as we do not look at this perishing world, but we look at the things which are not seen, the invisible and eternal spiritual world, and as we live to bring glory to God. This is the full text. It begins by saying the glory of God, and it gives the, the cause and the motivation and the purpose for which Paul does all these things, for which cause we faint not. His primary motivation and cause and purpose was the glory of God. That was the reason the glory of God caused him to see that his outer man is perishing. It didn't matter. I'm going to perish it more. I'm going to offer up my body again, 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 because I want to glorify God. And I'm not going to be preoccupied and look on this, the outer man with this perishing world. And that's why he renewed his inner man. And that's why he, he meditated upon the scriptures. And that's why he lived for Christ. He wanted to bring glory to God. These were just means to an end. To see the spiritual perspective that Paul had. Constantly going back and seeing that the things of heaven and of God and of Christ. I must keep that central. And all these things are fading away. And why, Paul, have you done these things? Because I want to give glory to God. Let our heart's focus be that of Paul's, who said, Whither therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that Paul did when he was in a good place was all to the glory of God. Let us be people with that one thought in mind, the glory of God. Let us not just say it. We know it. We know it. We know the the question to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question one, what is the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy him forever? We know that, but let us live it, brothers and sisters, that we might have 
the power of God in Christ and the inner man to live for him. Now, before I close this morning, I'd like to share a few words with you that do not know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you for a moment to be flexible with your thinking. Because what I've said before is the truth regarding this perishing world. And regarding if that is true, then his life has no purpose for me. It's meaningless, and it is, if that's true. That should bring gloom and despair to the honest heart, to the searching heart, as I've said, to the philosophers of, of yesteryear who thought on this. Read the book of Ecclesiastes, and you know what I mean. But I told you that our God is a, a God of all comfort. And so you that will, for a moment, be honest with yourselves and see that you've put your whole life into the outer man to improving yourselves, to make yourself attractive to someone else, to make, to advance your career, to put money in the bank, to have real estate, to be accepted by men and by women, by friends. Your focusing on life has solely been on the outer man, the temporary world which is perishing. Be honest with yourself. And if you've done that, then the conclusion is a rather depressing and dire one. But as I've said, if you will take a moment to be honest with yourself, you have a God, a God of all comfort that wants to comfort you. You are perishing. Absolutely. You're perishing yourself. But the God of all comfort loves you, has mercy and grace and truth. And so the verse that we all know speaks to that point. You're perishing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You are perishing, and more than just your body, your eternal soul will perish, no, not be annihilated, perish eternally, everlastingly, in judgment and hell and like a fire. You will perish eternally. But God so loved the world, that he gave Jesus so that you would not perish, perish in eternity, but rather have everlasting life with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need Christ. You need to know that you're perishing and you're perishing because of sin. You have a sin nature. Your sin nature causes your heart to go against God and to sin against God. And because of that, God in his judgment has to judge you in your souls perishing without Christ. And so God has given me authority as a preacher of the gospel to give you an offer that you can be saved from perishing. Yes, you will still die physically. But your eternal soul can be saved because Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. He shed his blood to make your heart and soul clean before God. He rose from the dead so you can have everlasting life. You need him. Admit in your heart that you're perishing because of sin and you need Christ. And you simply say to God, I need Christ. And God will hear your prayer and read your heart. And he will draw you to Christ so that his love and mercy and grace and peace will be expressed in saving you from being perished. Just simply trust Christ and be saved. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, help us all to see more clearly that this physical world that we sense with our senses, that we measure by the scientist's measurement is not all there is to life. Lord, there is life with you through Jesus. There's life in the spirit that we can see and we have seen with the eyes of faith. 
Help us to see more clearly. Help us to be like Moses who continually saw him, you, you, God, that are invisible. And help us to live for you. Help our, our, our hearts to be with you and with Christ and in your kingdom. And help us, help our hearts, brothers and sisters, help us, help us, God, not to have our heart in the things of this perishing world. And I pray for those that do not know you because they do not know Christ. And they're perishing and they will perish. Lord, help to see that they need Christ. And instead of having their soul perish in eternal torment, in hell and the lake of fire, they can have great hope, eternal hope, eternal life by trusting Jesus. Help somebody to trust Jesus today. Bless the food they're about to receive. And thank you so much for providing for all of our needs. Be with us, God, and help us to serve thee. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, your excuse.